It's McCabe and Jenny here from the Afternoon Mix and super excited today to catch up with singer, songwriter Matt Carney. How are you, man? I am wonderful. It's good to be here. Where where are you coming to us from? I'm in my studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Fall has finally arrived. And yeah, this is where I make a lot of my records. Is fall like your favorite time of year? By far, yes. (laughs) Why Why is that? I'm from the Northwest. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. So the Southern, I live in Nashville and have for a while and the Southern summers are just, I still don't understand them. It's just too hot for too long. Uh, So when fall comes around, yeah, it is special. And Matt, you're originally from Oregon. When I read about your story, it gave me chills. Can you kind of talk about that moment when you first moved cross country from Oregon to Nashville and you slept in the back of your truck? Uh, Yes, we... Well, I was going to school. I was playing soccer at Chico State University in California. And I met my uh, guy who produced a lot of my records with me. And he was living in Oregon. And he said, hey, I'm driving to Nashville for the summer. I want to be a producer. Will you help me drive? So I was supposed to be there for, I was supposed to be here for a month. And we packed up his truck. We slept in the back of it and drove across the country. And we got to Nashville. And I just was obsessed with songwriting and I didn't want to do anything else, you know? So at at the end of the summer, I was a junior going to my senior year. I remember calling my parents and my coach and being like, I'm not leaving. I'm staying here. Um, And I'm still here, I guess. I mean, what was something like you enjoyed about that experience and you never want to do again with that experience? Well, coming from the Northwest, we didn't have air conditioning in our truck. Like we didn't, like you don't necessarily need air conditioning all the time. You know, there's like maybe a week in Oregon where you're like, this is too hot, but yeah, no AC in his 85 Chevy S 10 truck. And, uh, that was, we didn't realize that when we got to the South, you definitely in August, we just showed up everywhere dripping in sweat, like every meeting, every friend's house. We also, we would, so we packed this truck and we would put the mattress on top of all of our stuff. So we jump, we park and then just jump on the back and sleep. And we had like normal backpacking sleeping bags like you use in the mountains. Yeah. And, and so when you show up to the South, they're like negative 20 degree bags, you know, or whatever. And you're sleeping and wake up just, we'd wake up every morning just dripping in sweat just cause it was like, this is not the right climate for this gear. It sounds so fun. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you're 20, you know, who cares? Like uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a fun journey. Yeah. We ended up sleeping in like a church parking lot for a while. And then we met some musicians and they let us crash on their um, couch for a week. And then eventually we got this like rundown apartment by like the end of August. That was like perfect. You know, it was like we had to pay no rent and we could set up a little studio and it's kind of where the magic started. You've come so far since then. I mean, you've had your music featured in TV shows like Grey's Anatomy and NCIS. Like, how did that all come about? Uh, I don't know exactly how that happens. It is funny when you, 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 songs, you know, they come, they're like these gifts, like you try to find them. And one day you sit down at the piano and you're like, here it is. And you get this moment and it's like the drug I chase. You find these songs. And then I send them my management. And then one day randomly you get a call and they're like, guess what? Uh, some doctors want to make out to this song on television. And you're like, <laughs> you're like totally. My dream that, has come true. It's, it's what I pictured in my brain was just people in scrubs, just like, you know, on top of a, a surgical board making out. Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, once it started taking off, that first record, my Nothing Left to Lose record, everyone just started licensing it. And there was a song called All I Need that was this big ballad that was in like Grey's Anatomy's season premiere. And I think once you get a couple of them, then people start using it. And it really worked for that format. When you're on tour, do you happen to just put on one of those shows and you're like, hey guys, check out this episode? <laughs> Who's that? I should. <laughs> I, early on, you know, you put out your record and it's like first week, you're like, oh, we sold a couple hundred records. And it was like a knife fight to get going. And when Grey's Anatomy featured it, I remember it was like a big deal. But I did notice when we played shows on Thursday nights, like the attendance was down less that first couple months. You know, it was like we had a lot of Grey's Anatomy fans showing up to the show. (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) No. Right? And I mean, you've done so much touring since then. You've toured with John Mayer and Sheryl Crow and trained to name a few. Do you have like 
the most memorable moment while you've been with those ex? Like, is there a story that popped out in your head where you're like, this was like one of the highlights of my career? Yeah, it's funny that I feel like that was all lost in me at the time as just a kid trying not to like screw up um, is what the feeling I mostly remember, you know, just like don't hold it together. I remember we opened for John Mayer on the Continuum Tour on the in Madison Square Garden and it was like 24,000 people, whatever, sold out 360. And before you walk out on stage, there's like this ramp that goes up to the stage and it has these massive murals of like Paul McCartney and the, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen. And it's like the most daunting feeling. You're like, they're in there like 30 feet tall, every one of them, right before you walk on stage. So it was like, it just the feeling of like, what are we doing here? Like there's a 30 foot tall Bruce Springsteen, like he belongs here. I don't belong here, but I, it was a really special show. Cause I remember by the end of it, we got like the first third of the crowd at when we finished, like kind of stood up and gave us a standing ovation. I was like, we're fooling them. It's working. This is, <laughs> this could work. I mean, that's a long way from traveling in the van. And after the, after you get out of a, a show like that, what, what are you feeling? What's going on? You're just like, Oh my God, we have reached it. Uh, honestly, that, that it's funny. Like I said before, I, I, I look back at those as some of these really fond memories. Cause you can, you can only kind of come up one time, you know, it's like, I tell artists that all the time now when I'm like, Hey, cherish this. Cause you can only like feel the, the, the first rise one time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, a lot of it was lost in me, honestly. Like I, I, I think you're just trying to work so hard and we were doing 250, 300 shows a year, just every radio thing, every, whatever you could do. Um, yeah. I, 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 but I look back at them as some of like the fondest, memories now to wind and down from my tour are you still you still skating? that's what you asked me yeah that was your question <laughs> so I, at the time i was just i don't remember like what after the show honestly in on that tour we were in a on the john mayer Sheryl crow tour we were in a van still and then by the continuum tour we moved up to a bus which changes the game van you're traveling during the day yeah staying in hotels in a bus you're traveling at night so you wake up and you're there but in the van, half the time it was like, okay, we have to pack our stuff. If we drive straight through the night, we will make sound check tomorrow in Cincinnati if we leave now. So a lot of it was just like, you're just practically tired and hanging on just to get to the next event. I was going to say like in your downtime, do you still skateboard? Is that still something? <laughs> uh, I, I did. I do. Yes. I have three girls and I have a longboard and, um, they all like to do it. Well, my oldest likes to do it the most. She's seven. So she wants to ride it all the time. I did crash on tour. So I've, I've, it slowed me down because uh, um, last time I really went hard, I bailed um, right before a show. So that wasn't very fun. What was like the <laughs> hardest you ever went when skateboarding? Was there a time where you're like, all right, maybe uh, I need a break for a long time? That was that moment. Yeah. It was like, okay, bro, like this is your, this is what you do for a living. Uh, they had, you know, like those sidewalks where they have like the brick, it's like brick, then cement, then brick. Yeah. And someone had laid a rub, red rubber hose on the brick. She so couldn't see it. And I was just flying up to the bus. So I was kind of looking off the distance, looking at the bus and just hit it full speed. And yeah. <laughs> We're glad you're okay. When uh, yep. you first started putting out music, when you first started this entire career, you didn't think you were good at it. Why was that when you are, I mean, clearly you put out so many <laughs> albums and music. I don't know time. if I, I don't know. It's imposter syndrome. Um, I don't know if I've ever felt good at it. I mean, that's not true. It early on, there was a passion about it, but I knew one of, I didn't start doing music till late in my career. So I didn't start writing songs till I was in college. So like my nothing left to lose record, which blew up was, you know, 13 of the first, 17 songs I'd ever written. So there was a kind of like a build the ship as you go thing I've had to do with this whole my whole time is just like, I don't really know how to play any other songs than my songs. So we'll just play those or I don't know, in some ways, I had a not a normal musician story of how it all started. Well, that brings us to new music. Uh, let's talk about your song Kevlar and the story behind that. Yeah, Kevlar. Um, is a deeply personal song. Uh, I wrote it with a friend named Henry, Henry Brim. He, he's Brill, he's like this English dude we'd never written together. And I remember 
sometimes you do this in Nashville, you do co-writing and it's like dating. Like you just, it's like a first date. It's like you met him on Tinder and you're like, Hey, uh, we're meeting at a coffee shop and you don't even know anything about him. Uh, I've actually never done that. I'm a little check those profile that. pictures when you do that. I mean, but that's all you, yeah. Like songwriting, you got no profile pic. You're just like, I don't know this person. That's how we became co-hosts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't know what each other was like. Yeah. Hey, well, it's working. Uh, <laughs> But they, but we met and we were just having this conversation about my, just stuff I was going through. And I was telling him like about my bushes that had died in this frost. And um, he came with this one line, if it feels like forever ago, that's because it was. And I was like, he just said that. He's like, I don't know what that is. I was like, oh, that's like everything we've been talking about. And over the course of the next hour, he just kept like throwing at me things I had said like three hours earlier and our coffees like, you know, like your bushes that got killed in the frost. I was like, that's an amazing lyric. Let's put that in there. So it, it was this really organic kind of strange um, conversation that turned into a song. Well, what does, okay. I had to look up what Kevlar means or when you sing about it, is it referring to that type of fabric? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, it's really about um, those relationships in your life that someone I, I i it's like a cry to someone who's holding on to something and you're trying to reconcile with them or someone you know that is hiding behind their kind of pain and it's not allowing them to kind of like live in their fullest you know so that line of you hang your pain over your chest like a ball and chain with a kevlar vest it's like um that's really the the whole song's about that. And so Kevlar was just a weird word. And I was like, let's name it a weird word. So it was in the song. So we just made it the title. I like but it. It's a great title. And I mean, another great title is Coming Home, Oregon, which I saw that you are selling some merch. We, yeah, we are. The, so is this like on high demand to have this? Well, I posted an acoustic version of me playing it. And everyone was like, I need that shirt. It was a shirt I had. It was just like a one-off, you know, we had made and everybody's like, I need that shirt. So I was like, all right, let's do it. So we put it together. And um, yeah, coming home was this song I wrote that um, on a whim, just missing my home. And I wrote it about Oregon and it's become this whole thing where like at every Oregon ducks football game, they play it between the first and second quarter, the Oregon lottery has used it. And um, it's became this anthem in my home state, which has been this crazy, just exciting gift to have. Does that mean you have season tickets? <laughs> I mean, I don't live there, but yeah, I, I'm pretty much like, if I show up, they let me in. Yeah, generally. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre because you did say after moving to Nashville, you weren't going to be coming back to Oregon. So ironic that <laughs> I know. have merch now. <laughs> I, well, I mean, that's not totally true because I it was supposed to be a road trip. Mm -hmm. And somehow, tw you know, like I love, it's funny, the places that, Oregon is a really special place to be from and you don't realize it till you move and travel across the country like wow that is one of the most beautiful places on earth like I didn't know it growing up as a kid how beautiful it was until you're like traveling around the country and you're like I won't name any states but you're like this place is not as cool as where I grew <laughs> you can up say it, it's Iowa <laughs> yeah I, I was kind of cool I like Des Moines I like Des Moines Des Moines is a vibe Iowa City is a, is a vibe too um but yeah maybe there isn't the uh, natural beauty like you have in the Cascade Mountains um but yeah, it's just like I I missed it and just happened to write that song because because I want I'm in every summer about August in the South I'm like yo where is this 79 degree heat no bugs green grass weather. Well, Matt County, we're looking forward to seeing you um, September 14th at the Vic Theater. What are you looking forward to uh, on this tour? And then for those who have not been to your show, what can they expect? Uh, I mean, it's it is one of the coolest um shows we put together it's definitely like very band driven which i guess everybody would say but it for me it's like it's kind of like a rock show i i, I think there's like um my new record i had this band called the brook and the bluff who's like this nashville band i love so much they're like the band on half the record um so there's this kind of 70s fleetwood mac rock thing happening um but it's just really cool to be at the stage of your career and have like a really cool group of songs to work with. So there's new stuff that's really fun to throw in there when you want to try, but like having this like catalog, you're every night, the set list becomes really hard, but it's just special. Cause you're like, man, this is like, 
action packed. We got we have some bangers to bring. Um, it, that that's a fun thing to have in your arsenal. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We're looking forward to your show and getting some of that merch you were talking about at the Vic. <laughs> I'll bring you some. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Matt Carney, for taking the time with one hundred one point nine The Mix.